it's got a huge potential capital base, a huge deposit base. And it can leverage that into many times that sum and loans. And it, so they have the fractional reserve power to empower the people, and that way the money stays in the state. It's not sold into derivatives to Thailand or to Russia or to England. Uh, and, and, and so you have sovereignty and you have transparency. Instead of take the state of Texas, takes most of the tax money, invest it uh, in secretive funds and derivatives, and then the comprehensive annual financial reports show they've got a double set of books. And that was okay, though it gave the bankers great power, the private bankers, when the derivatives were on the way up. But now the states are all bankrupt because the bankers set them up. They swindled all the tax money investments. And, and, and so now we're defunct just where the bankers wanted us. So in this big states' rights movement, we need to move to have other states look at state banks. That is state uh, you know, where the state's money is in a public bank. Uh, stay there. We'll be right back. All right, Ellen, this is a short segment, long segment coming up, but this is so important. I know it's not basketball or football or getting drunk for new listeners out there that may be tuning in, but it's, it's getting control of our lives. If we let offshore banks have the power to issue all the currency and credit they want, they're going to take over, and they have, and announce themselves our rulers and a new empire. And they're very corrupt, wicked people who also believe in eugenics. So we, we must take our states back to get our federal government back. And the example of North Dakota is a great uh, uh, case point example. Now, now you've written about this in your book. Uh, you've got webofdebt.com. Uh, let's, let, let's walk through what a state bank is. Not a state charter bank, but a, a bank of the state that's transparent and, and, and how this could be rolled out in other states. In North Dakota... I, as I mentioned, all of the revenues of the um, state go into the bank, and then those become the deposits, plus they take depositors from um, individuals, or take deposits. So, you know, the way banking works, the, the bank just makes loans to anybody it, needs, it wants to make loans to, but then when the, when the checks go out of the bank, they have to clear through a, a clearing house, usually the Federal Reserve, but the... Um, Bank of North Dakota isn't actually a member of the. Well, I guess they are a member, but they don't. They don't have FDIC insurance, and they don't. They don't use it. So anyway, that so the checks have to clear by. You have to have the same amount going in in the way of deposits as you have going out. As far as I can see, that that's really just a ruse to make it look like you're not creating money on your books because those deposits coming in are like Mr. Smith. The check that just came in is not the same. Is not the money that Mr. Jones has going out in the form of a check. In other words, Mr. Smith never said that Mr. Jones could borrow his money. And you never go into the bank and they say, "I'm sorry, we just lent your money out for 30 years. Come back later." They always have the money. It's because they have this sort of fungible pool, and they make that pool sort of serve all purposes. Well, the goldsmiths discovered 500 years ago that they would hold your gold because you didn't want to keep it in your house, and then they could give you the receipts, and that no one hardly ever came in at once wanting all their gold. And even if a few people did, you still had enough, so that's what allowed it. But, but explain to people how a, a state bank like North Dakota has empowers the people and how it works and how it's different from the system that the private bankers have. Okay, in, in North Dakota, the state bank is actually pretty much a banker's bank. They do make some commercial loans, but mostly they are partnering with the other banks. So where all the other state banks have a capital problem because of the Bank for International Settlements capital requirement and um, the fact that they, they had this dodgy collateral on their books that froze, uh, froze the whole credit mechanism, etc., it used to be that we, there were secondary lenders called shadow lenders, the investors, who would buy these collateralized debt obligations, which are bundled mortgages, off the banks, and then they, that would clear their books and they could make another set of loans and another set of loans all based on the same capital. But when those shadow lenders went away, the banks were stuck with the limits of their original capital. So that froze up credit. Well, in North Dakota, the Bank of North Dakota... Uh, serves as the, um, it partners with those banks and it takes the loans off their books, making room for more and more. So generally the, the, the 
community banks, the local banks, are dealing directly with the cu- customers, and then the Bank of North Dakota it backstops those banks, rather like the Federal Reserve does. It's sort of like the mini Fed for the state. Yeah, it's but, the insurance policy, but but you know, not just the Bank of North Dakota. We see local state banks that are private. Uh, being much more healthy than the big mega banks that created these derivatives. And under the new bank re-regulation legislation, actually written by Goldman Sachs and others, it allows them to come in and take over the healthy state or regional banks. Right. Uh, so so we see a major consolidation taking place here. Right. So, so that if you have a state bank, it can help those struggling little banks that are struggling with that now they're talking about raising the capital requirement. They're making it even more difficult for the little local banks, and so the state bank can help with that. One major advantage is that all the interest goes back to the state. So, so in North Dakota, it's actually a, a, a big money maker for the state. They get a big dividend every year, so that reduces the amount of taxes that people have to pay. But plus, it's got a mission statement that is toward helping the state. So we're a, a private bank, it, like any corporation, has to serve its shareholders. So if Goldman Sachs can make more money speculating in derivatives than in making commercial loans to businesses that might go bankrupt, they have to speculate. That's what their business model is. They have to serve their private shareholders. And they money. have lobbyists at the state level getting the state to invest tax money in their system, giving them more power. Stay there. Let's come back and talk about how we roll this out in other states and if you're starting to see uh, this being discussed in, in other states. Uh, here's one. U.S. states uh, pension funds becoming federal issue. It talks about state pension funds going bankrupt because they invested them in derivatives. Don't worry. The feds are going to take it over and only give you part of your money back. Folks, it's happened everywhere else and it's happening here. People better get their priorities straight. Um, going back to Ellen Brown, the website's webofdebt.com. She's got a great book out on the subject of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but then another uh, important article, cash-strapped states need to play the banking game. North Dakota shows how. Let's say you were on national news, um, Ellen, and you had five minutes to explain this, the basic bullet points, why it's important, what the alternative means going with the offshore bankers. I mean, if you had five minutes to just nail it and, 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 and to crystallize why this is such a great avenue to financial liberty and sovereignty and freedom, what would you say? Well, we have a, still have a credit freeze on in all the states. And if you own your own bank, you can create credit. And states have a huge deposit and capital base with which they can... Um, leverage their money and create credit so they could fund many things that we think we don't have the money for now like infrastructure and education and low-cost housing plus states are paying well in california we're paying an average of 4.7 percent interest on our debt if you're a bank banks borrow from each other at the federal funds rate of zero to 0.25 percent that's what the fed funds rate is right now so it's an average of something like 0.2 percent so if, if you're a bank, just for starters, the state could start funding its projects at a very low interest rate. And we've seen that, well, recently there was a lawsuit for these uh, big banks that were colluding to set prices. So the states are paying oh, much more than they than they should be paying for, for interest. Plus, we're subject to the rating agencies. You know, California, where I live, is has a rating that's just hovering above Reese's. And we in California, the state has never defaulted on its debt. And there are the, the Wall Street banks, which would be bankrupt totally if we, the people, including largely California, hadn't bailed them out. They are paying this incredibly low interest rate, and we're paying a high rate because of our bad credit rating. So we could play their game. In other words, we can step into their shoes and get all the perks that a bank gets by being a bank. Continue. Um, well, I, I had started to explain about how banks create money. When a bank, um, it first it creates money on its books, and then the, the check goes out of the bank, and then it has to clear. It, and if the bank doesn't have the deposit to make it clear, then it just borrows that money back from the other banks. 
and it borrows at 0.2% interest. So essentially what it does is it creates money, the money goes out, and it borrows that very same money back. In other words, the pool has enough money out there because it just created it and put it out into the pool. It borrows that same money back at 0.2% interest, the Fed funds rate, or, you know, one point something if they're taking longer CDs or whatever, but still it's a very low interest rate. And then they relend that to the state at, like, California, 4.7%, or to individuals at 6% or something, or on credit cards up to 30% or whatever it is. So they're, they're getting this huge spread. And if you own the bank, then that spread becomes taxpayer money. I mean, it goes back into the pool and feeds the pool. You had mentioned about the comprehensive annual financial report.